Good morning, everybody. This is like one of my favorite times of the year, all right? 52 weekend, well, 50 weekends a year, you have to listen to what I want to say to you. I get to pick the topics, I get to pick the sermons, and the only thing you can do is walk out if you don't like it or like, you know, you know something's coming up so you don't show up. But today and another time in the year, twice a year, we do live Q&A. And so we're going to be doing live Q&A, and we're going to start in just a minute, and, and uh, we're going to pray before we start, but uh, they'll throw up some uh, numbers where you can text and also a website that slido.com you go to on your mobile phone and then there, you can add questions in there and you can vote up and down questions, okay? Now one thing that's a little bit different today and some people didn't get this last night so let me explain it to you again. Last weekend and this weekend the kids are, there's no kids church. So the kids are all upstairs with us. So as you ask questions please keep in mind that there will be children listening to your questions and if you don't keep that in mind like if we have a G audience for the, the sermon and somebody asks a R plus question, it, it's not going to get out, all right? We're not, we're not going to read it. So just keep that in mind. If you feel like, well, Pastor Dave, I really wanted to know about da-da-da-da. Yeah, well, if you really want to know about it, talk to me in private. I'm not going to discuss it in front of children, okay? And, and so we're going to be doing that. And the information is up there. And so let's prepare by asking the Lord to be with us. The grounds are like this. If I'm giving you my opinion, I will tell you it's my opinion. If I am explaining to you what Scripture seems to plainly say or what most or many Bible scholars seem to plainly say, I will express it in that way. There are some questions that really don't have much grounding for it. And I will say that uh, if, if I say it's just my opinion, you're free to, to, to believe it or not, but if you don't agree with me, you're probably wrong. And I will try and answer every question that is acceptable as a question and if I don't know the answer, I'll make up an answer so good that you won't be able to tell the difference. So do you want to know if it's just now? Anyway, all right, so let's pray. Wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you that you allow us to ask questions of you, of your glory, of your majesty, of, of who you are, of how your plan comes into play. You do not expect us, Lord, to, to blindly believe things that others tell us, but you allow us to read your word, you allow us to discuss, you allow us to to question, Father, and we want to have a godly questioning mind that we might know you more and more, that we might understand you better so that we can apply these things to our lives. Father, in our time today, I pray that you would speak to everybody's heart. I pray that you would speak to them about the questions on their mind and on their heart. I pray that you would help me to answer in a way that would be effective. I pray, most importantly, not the things that I say, but the Spirit of God would take the things I say and you would apply them to different people's hearts. And that as we finish today, we would have a better understanding of who you want us to be and how you want us to live. And we would become closer and closer to being what you want us to be, which is more and more like your son, your true children in heaven. So be with us through this time, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go. Questions? As an American, what's your personal opinion of Vladimir Putin? As an American, it's not my business to have a personal opinion of Vladimir Putin. He's not my president. And so I am willing to express publicly my opinion on American politics, even though most people disagree with me, uh, on because I don't, I don't choose one side or the other. I'm very eclectic about the things I like and I don't like. Vladimir Putin, it's not my place. I'm not going to speak one way or, or another against him. So, If you really want to know what I think, you should ask me what I think of a certain American's policy towards him, and then that would give it, but no, I'm just kidding. How do you know if it's God's voice or not? Do you really hear it? Is it like yourself talking to you on the inside? All right, so this is how I understand this question, and, and it's a great question. This is my experience, okay? There are some things that I know, and I believe, and I, I absolutely believe, you know, Jesus talked about being the good shepherd and everything else, and he said, my sheep know my voice. And so I believe, now this is, that, that's a statement on a broad theological spectrum as opposed to a false shepherd and stuff, but I believe I have the capacity to understand how God speaks to me through the Holy Spirit. I have that capacity. But I also believe it needs to be trained, and it needs to be consistent. So this is my understanding of how that process works, okay? Most of us hear kinds of different voices in our head. I mean, not actual audio vo audible voices, but, you know, like, go ahead, do it. Nah, don't do it, you know, you know, that kind of thing like that. All right, so there are things that I know that God says because they're in the Word of God. If you want to know what God's saying, your, your overwhelmingly best source is the Word of God. 
And so, for instance, let me just give you an example. I know that the Bible says I'm supposed to forgive other people. So what does it say? Be ye kind. This is, I, I memorized it when I was a kid. That's why it's memorized in King James. Be ye kind one to another, loving one another and forgiving one another just as God in Christ forgave you. I know I have to forgive other people. So suppose somebody does something to me and I'm just really irritated. And in my mind, I hear that, that Vulcan voice that says, don't get mad, get even. Yeah? And then I hear another voice that says, be kind one to another. Tenderhearted, forgiving. Dave, you need to forgive that person. And that forgiveness is not wrapped up in whether they deserve it. It's not wrapped up in whether anything else. It's wrapped it up in because God forgave you through Jesus Christ. Now, I know the Vulcan voice isn't God. And I know all the voices that are saying, well, I'll forgive them later when I don't care anymore. Those are myself. But the voice that's telling me to forgive them, that's what God sounds like because it's in harmony with the word of God. Now, my personal experience is that I put my trust in God and I follow what I believe God is saying, that I can learn to determine when those kinds of things come from God. So if I'm getting ready to pray for somebody and I, Lord, I don't know what to pray for, and then I feel this thing, uh, go ahead and pray. They need a new job. Now, I don't know if they need a new job or not, but I begin to pray. Ah, oh, Lord, give them a new job. And then a, a week or so later, I found out they said, hey, I just got a new job. And I didn't say it to anybody, but I really needed a new job. And then I, I oh, yeah, that was the voice of the Lord. So... This is my personal experience, and I think it can be effective. However, let me say to you very clearly, the best way to know God's direction in your life or God's, what God wants for your life is to read the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to experience it. Now, there's one more issue here that's really important. Everybody's worried about what does God, what's God's plan for my life. This is God's plan for his li your life. It's the same for all of us. It doesn't have anything to do with where we go to school, who we marry, what job we have, what country we live in. Uh, you know, anything else like that. God's plan for our lives, according to the book of Romans, is that we would all be conformed to the image of his son. So what God wants from you and me is for us to be more like Jesus. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but what country you live in, what job you have, what your major is in college is not the major determining factor in whether you're more like Jesus. What's the major determining factor is whether you listen to him and obey him and make a conscious effort to be more like him. So I, I started off with forgiveness. Let's look at forgiveness. No matter who you are, no matter what job you have, no matter who you're married to, you're going to have to forgive other people. You're going to choose to either forgive or not forgive. God in Christ forgave you. If you don't forgive others, you cannot be like your Father in heaven. Now, don't, don't get this wrong, because there's a bunch of passages in Scripture where, where it seems to say that if you don't forgive others, you can't be forgiven. And, and people always say, well, that's not fair that God makes that like that. No, that's not the point. The point is like this. God is a forgiving God. He's always been a forgiving God. He created us to love us, and all throughout what we have and understand, all throughout from the very beginning of Scripture, he forgives. If you choose not to forgive others, you can't be his child. You yourself personally have taken yourself out of it and said, I'm not willing to be your child. You can't say, well, God excluded me. No, you excluded yourself. If you're in his family, you have to obey the family rules. And if you choose not to be like him, then you're not like him. And that's your choice. So that's how you become more like Jesus. You obey the word of God and you listen to the voice of the spirit. Great question. Thank you. How do you get your kids to go to church? All right, we talked about this on the way in because I had a question like this last night. Um, all right, so my daughter was raised in church. My daughter's there in, in the interest of full disclosure. Uh, she was raised to understand that we went to church, not just because we were pastors, but that's what we do. This is what our family does. We go to church. We don't have to go to church. We get to go to church. And, and we're going to go to church. That's, that's something our family does. Even if we're traveling, we go to church. Even if it's not our church, even if nobody knows who we are, we go to church. That's what the Kennys do. And so she was raised knowing that that's one of the things that she did. Now, understand, and I talked this, a little bit more about this, and we can go down this question if there are questions. Understand that, that kids, there are points in children's life when you have to tell them the decisions they need to make, but your job as a parent is through the things that you tell them to help them understand boundaries. And as they understand boundaries, as they get older, you can begin to allow them to make decisions. And some of those decisions, I mean, let's face it, there's a point in time in which your kids don't want to go to church. 
and you need to have that conversation with them. And if they are a certain age, and I'm not going to tell you what that age is for your kids, then you have to respect their autonomy and integrity. But I was just talking with somebody about this in the early part of the service. Look, if you're parenting now, you need to understand that the way you deal with your two-year-old has to be done in terms of what you expect from them when they're 20. Yeah? Thank you. I like that. I, I like an agreement. It, it, it needs to be that way. So discipline is corrective. It's not arbitrary. You never discipline kids because you're mad at them or they embarrassed you. That's what I find a lot in Asia. Parents get mad at their kids and discipline them, not because they did something wrong, but because they embarrassed the parents. If you do that, you're teaching them that there's no such thing as right and wrong. It just matters whether you get caught or not. Yeah? And so you, you teach them about right and wrong. You make dis discipline consistent. I, I think I told you, you know, you guys know that, that my background, my personality is that it's easy for me to forgive others, but it's really easy for me to blow up. And one of the biggest, most transformative things for me as a person learning how to control my temper was that when I would get upset at my daughter, especially when she was very young, but until now, if I get upset and I speak harshly to her, unfairly to her, I have to go apologize. Yeah? And so I'm a dad and I'm a grown man and everything else, and I have to go and talk to my five-year-old daughter and say, you know, princess, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. That wasn't fair. Please forgive me. Now, I was glad to do it. I knew it was important to do it, but it's a little bit hard, right? And because I knew that, then I, whenever I'd get tempted to speak harshly or something like that, respond inappropriately because I was tired, because I was irritated, because somebody else had bothered me, or sometimes because she was being a five-year-old or whatever, I knew that I needed to control what I said and did because I would be responsible for that and the result of it would be that I would need to go apologize. So better not do it at all. And that was a big help to me. Thank you, Princess. You helped me overcome my, some of my anger issues. Now that she's gone, I can be angry all the time. That's not. Anyway, great question. Thank you. So you can't make your kids go to church. Now, one of the things we did, and we laughed about it this morning, was one of the things we did is Isabel got a little bit older, and, and, and uh, she, just, she said to us one day, why do I have to go to church on Saturday night and Sunday morning twice? Why do I have to go to church three times? We said, Princess, you don't have to go. If you want to stay home on Saturdays, you can. So she stayed home on Saturdays, and after the church was over, we went out with friends. We had a nice dinner. We did some things together. When we got home, she'd say, where are you guys? Oh, we went out to dinner. We did it up. Oh, yeah? Oh, I think I'm going to go on Saturdays. And uh, yeah, she wanted to be included with the family. And so we do everything we can to make being in church together special. And that's one of the ways we do it. Ultimately, remember this. And I, I had this conversation with a woman the other day. She was telling me, Pastor Dave, my husband doesn't want to go to church. I keep telling him, blah, 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 you need to go to church. And I said, look, your, your problem is not that your husband doesn't go to church. Your problem is that your husband's not following Jesus. If you make him go to church, if you get so irritated at him that he goes to church, but he's not following Jesus, you've lost rather than won. Let's pray for your husband to follow Jesus, and let's worry about where he goes to church later. Yeah? And so let's understand those. With kids, bring your kids up knowing that church is a part of your life, attending church, but you all know, you understand that just being here is not the goal. It's participating, it's engaging, it's learning and reading the word of God. And we have some good friends who were ministered a lot to IES and they came to me, they were so troubled because their daughter, who was an adult, quit going to their church. And it was a long and complicated story, but basically their daughter was in part of a small group and the leader of that small group was from the church and then he quit going to that church. And so the pastor weird things pastors do. The pastor threw the small group out of the church, right? And so she quit going to church. She was going to a small group instead. And they said, we feel so bad. Our daughter quit going to church. I said, no, she didn't quit going to church. She just went to a different kind of church. It was a small group. They were all engaged. They all loved the Lord. They did things together. I said, see the positive and not the negative. And it worked out fine. She still follows the Lord vibrantly. She just doesn't go to a building with a group of people. She goes to a home with 20 people or so. Same thing, no problem. Great question, thank you. Huh, was Judas created to betray Jesus? Oh, you Calvinists are always going to sneak this stuff in. And had no hope of salvation. The same with Lucifer betraying God. Are some people destined to go to hell like Judas, given his utility and the death of Jesus Christ and the lack of repentance? Okay, we read Matthew. Somebody look it up for me really, really quick in the back. We read Matthew where Jesus is at the Lord's table. Uh, Jesus is this. I talked about this last week when we talked about acceptance. And so whoever asked this question wasn't paying attention last week or they were on vacation. Somebody look it up to me. I, I think it's Matthew chapter. Can you throw it up there? It's uh, woe to the... Uh, the 
It was, de it was destined that the one who would, anyway, see if you can throw it up there. Uh, it's maybe 24. Google real quick, woe to the one who betrayed him. And throw it up there. So this is my understanding. This is what Jesus says. All right? Judas has already betrayed him. The sequence is important. Judas has already betrayed him. He's made a deal with the, 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 the Pharisees, the high priests actually, and they've already made a decision. He's already agreed on the price, and then they gather together at this table. And then when they're gathered together at this table, as they're sharing the meal, Jesus said, somebody's going to betray me. And everybody goes, oh, is it me? And Judas goes, oh, how does he know? You know, that's, that's the difference. And they're all doing the Lord is it I, or, you know, all that kind of thing like that. Jesus says, the one who shares his food with me, which would have been anybody at the table. And this is what Jesus says. The Son of Man will go just as it was written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. This is my understanding of that issue. Yes, Jesus was going to be betrayed. It was going to be betrayed. It was God's plan that he would be sold out by his own people and he would die on the cross for our sins. However, that does not give Judas the excuse for being the one to do it. If Jesus, if Jesus is saying, woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man, it would have been better for him if he had not been born. If Jesus was saying that, then it means that he would have made a choice. And he made the wrong choice. And that's what I believe that Jesus was offering him even at that point. Even at that point, Jesus could have said, what have I done? And he could have changed his mind. Now you say, well, Pastor Dave, how do you know that? Because I know what happened to Peter. Peter sold him out too. Peter stood around the fire and cursed and said, oh, I don't know him. I'm not a religious guy. I don't know who that guy is. And he realized what he had done and he wept bitterly. And then he followed Jesus. And so I believe with all my heart. Now, if God would have said this and said, no, Judas is going to betray Jesus, so therefore it's not really his fault, that doesn't make any kind of sense. This whole statement doesn't make any kind of sense. Now, theologically, I understand the issues of predestination. However, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not Reformed. I am from the holiness movement, and I believe in free will. I, I believe in a God who is so big that my free will and your free will and the free will of 7 billion people doesn't interfere with his plan and purpose at all. It's like if all the ants who live in my building would say, we're going to have an ant revolt and we're going to take over and kick out the kinnies. Nah, you get them started and I'll just spray, 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 spray and it's all over for all of them. Okay? We cannot interfere with God's plan and purpose. People say, I don't want to go down too far down this road. But people say, see, God is outside of time, which is true. Time is something he created. And so God sees all time and, and then free will exists and God sees what's happened. That's actually not biblical because biblically what we understand is that God not only knows what will happen, he knows what would have happened. And that's what the prophets do many times. The prophets say, now listen, Israel, you disobeyed God. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. God knows both alternatives. Yeah. And you say, well, Pastor Dave, how can that be right? When you think of God relating to us, don't be so absurd as to think we can understand who he is. Just as an ant cannot comprehend a human, the gap between an ant and a human is minuscule compared to the gap between us and the creator of everything. Everything that exists came in to be. So you're thinking, well, yeah, before God made everything, it was just all this space. No, he created space. There was all, well, what was it? We don't know. We don't have the capacity to think of those things. So anyway. No, it's not, it's, not, it's not Lucifer's fault. I mean, it is Lucifer's fault. He wasn't an agent of God. It's not, uh, it is Judas's fault. He suffered for the decision he made. He killed himself. Uh, nobody is excused. There is that passage that said God does not cause people to be tempted. God does not call, cause people to sin. Great question. Thank you. How do dukuns? Now, I understand dukuns. Spiritual cleanser sounds like something you spray in your sink and clean up. Um, uh, how do they work? Uh, are they legit? Okay, look, we all understand. Uh, uh, if you have a Western perspective, you may, may not uh, accept this, but I think everybody who lives in this part of the world understands there are many spiritual forces at work. The biblical worldview is that there are spiritual forces that are unclean spirits, or another word that's used for them is demons. The Bible does not tell us where they come from. In fact, most people, modern people, assume they're fallen angels, but the Bible never says that and never probably even actually hints that. 
But wherever they are from, whatever their purpose is, they are, they are in their purpose of destroying, tearing down, and making God's creation bad. So they are our enemies. There are real spiritual forces. They have real spiritual power. And some dukuns, some mysticals, some occultic things operate in that realm. Others operate through fraud. They are, so some, for me to say all dukans are legit would, would not be wise. It's not true. Some of them are operating fraudulently. And then, but there are spiritual forces. However, as Christians, as followers of God, we need to remember that God sent his son into the world to redeem us and ultimately to redeem creation. So we may be the enemies of those unclean powers, but we are not destined to be their victims. We are destined to victory through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we're destined to be with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth. Great, wonderful question. And stay away from Dukelands. What is IES dress code? All right, we only have one dress code, and that is a platform dress code, and our platform dress code is reasonable and proper. The only specific thing is we have what we call the no belly button rule. And the no belly button rule says that if you're on the platform, when you do this with your hands, your belly button shouldn't show. It is not a gender specific rule. In fact, the reason we implemented it is we had a, a man, one of our worship leaders who was a man, he always wore short shirts. And when he raised his hands up like that, it would show his belly button and we all thought it was not very appealing. So our dress code is reasonable and proper. And that is determined by the consensus of people. I, I, I just told everybody, I said, uh, we discussed it amongst the deacons. The deacon said, Pastor Dave, you define it. And what I said is, please uh, uh, ascribe to reasonable and proper. If you don't believe and if, if you don't, uh, if it becomes a problem, then we'll make rules. But rules are not, you know, uh, oh, you're, you're, you know, the straps on your shoulder need to be like, you know, this wide or this wide, you know, all that kind of stuff. That, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we have a dress code, reasonable, proper. Only rule is no belly button rule. All right. So great question. Thank you. All right, what does? We don't care where you've been. We care where you're going. This is one of our family values. What it means is this. No matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what your past is, no matter what's going on currently in your life, we welcome you to be a part of IES. And our concern is not whether you were a liar or a cheater or a stealer, uh, whether you deal with this particular kind of problem or this particular kind of problem. Our concern is not you are welcome regardless. But we are concerned about your spiritual future. And what we want is for you to grow to be more and more like Jesus every day. This helps us when we deal with some of the big questions that exist in our world and, and how the church relates to some kinds of questions. So please understand, you don't need to be a follower of Jesus Christ to come to IES. There are, there are a number of people who come to IES who will tell me, Pastor Dave, I'm an atheist or I'm like this or this, but I like coming to church because I like to hear about the Word of God. Or sometimes they won't say the Word of God, they'll just say the Bible. That's fine, we accept you. However, please understand our goal is to have you be transformed to the image of the Son of Jesus. We want you to become more and more and more like Jesus every day. So that's what it really means. And so let, let's, just say, let's just say the issue of lying. Um, so somebody comes to us and, and they're, they're a liar. And they come and they become a part of the church. And as long as their lying is in their history or something like that, uh, we want them, because as they get to know God, the Bible says God is truth. Now, don't, don't misunderstand this. That doesn't mean that God speaks the truth. If you, if you believe that, then what you're doing is you're saying truth is an arbitrary standard to which God has to apply. God made everything. So you say, well, the speed of light is 186,000 something something miles per hour. That's a, that's a constant. No, God made light work that way. He's the constant, all right? So everything that God says is true. And truth is defined in God, not God defined in truth. Therefore, if you're a liar, you need to change that because by the nature of telling lies consistently, you're making yourself be more distant. So we hope that as you're a part of the church and you experience the word of God and the presence of God, you're going to start saying, wow, I need to start telling the truth. But if you don't and we find out you're still lying, then as a church, we have an obligation to try and explain to you, you know, it's more important for you to tell the truth because we care where you're going. We're not going to tell you, we don't accept liars in here. We're going to tell you, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all just speak the truth in love and we want you to move that way. Now you can apply that across all kinds of issues. All right. One of the biggest issues in our current world is the whole issue of gender, same-sex attraction, all those other kinds of things like that. Look, 
We don't care where you've been. We care where you're going. That's what we have to say on those, all of those issues. And I'll, be, I'll, I'll talk more about it if you, want, if you want to go that direction. Okay, let's go. What's my view on plastic surgery? Well, for those of you who know known me for a while, you know that like five years ago I had a, I had a gastric sleeve surgery. Now, you, you can say what you want. It was largely for health, but one of the side effects was I lost a lot of weight. I used to be quite a bit bigger than I am now. Um, and, and I did the surgery for health reasons. But for me to, you know, get mad at somebody because they had plastic surgery, like they don't want their ears to fly, you know, so they, they did the pin back the ears thing. Look, I'm not sure that anybody except the person with the ears really cares what their ears do, honestly. But if a person feels bad about the way their ears look and they have the money to spend on fixing their ears, I'm not going to judge them. As long as a person has the right idea, I think that, you know, but I think, I, I think there is an obsession in our current world with outward appearance, and I think it's becoming more and more unhealthy. It's almost reaching the one that existed during the Mediterranean world during the time of the Greek and Romans. The Romans were so obsessed with physical appearance and all those kinds of things like that that you know, you understand, if a child was born in Rome of Roman parents and they had a, a disfiguring birthmark or anything else like that, those children were just abandoned. They were just put out as, as infants, newly born infants on the street and out in the countryside and then they died, of course, because the parents believed that, that, that a child that had like an unfortunate birthmark or something like that uh, shouldn't live. In fact, there's a, there's a term that's used in the Bible. Paul talks about, uh, and last of all, Jesus appeared to me as to one unnaturally born. And that term unnaturally born actually would be translated roughly into the English language as a stillborn person. And it was a phrase that was used of somebody that was so physically unattractive, people would have said, that person should have been aborted. That person should have died at birth. And that's the way the Romans were. That's the world that the church crashed in on. And the church said, no. Everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone has value in the kingdom of God. We will, we will save every child. We will care for every person. We will respond to every need. And, and we're going to be different from the world. And so that's not to speak against plastic surgery, but let's not get obsessed, okay? Right, great question. By the way, plastic surgery surgeons do a lot of really good work helping people who have, have uh, you know, bad burns or different things like that. So, you know, let's not... Let's not it is a legitimate medical need. All right, good, good, great question. How are we supposed to look at an interpreter and apply Luke 12, 51 to 53 in today's age? Do you think I came to bring priests on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Okay, this is the peace, the sword issue. Look, I, how do I apply it? I see it all the time. Uh, there are people in our church who are separated from their families because they have made a decision to follow Jesus and their family doesn't accept it for them. I know it's a reality, and that's what we need to understand. And that's one of the reasons that the church needs to be a home for everybody, because there are people who have left their families, have been rejected by their families, have been rejected by the people around them because they follow Jesus. We need to be their families. That's what that verse is all about. Great, great question. That's how we apply it. Uh, broader applications, I, I think let's just stick with the church application. Are there people who are in conflict in their profession, in their family, in their community, and in their culture because of their following Jesus? Absolutely. I can think of dozens. Okay. Star Trek or Star Wars? Absolutely Star Trek. I am absolutely, yeah. Star Wars is okay, yeah. Uh, my friend Royal's here, and, and Royal and I went and watched the original Star Trek together. And how many times, I don't know. But we had to stand in line because in those days they only showed it at one theater. Star Wars is okay, but I'm, I'm a Star Trek guy. Yeah, it's just really, really clear to me. All right, good question. All right. Is Pokemon satanic? Should kids not play Pokemon or read Harry Potter? All right, so is Pokemon satanic? No, it's technical. I mean, if you understand what's behind it. Can people get obsessed with it? Sure, people can get obsessed with anything. All right. Now, do, do we need to have boundaries as parents with our kids on things like that? Yeah, we should. We need to understand those things we need to do. If a 40-year-old is running around collecting Pokemons, and I, I, everybody, every 40-year-old in the world, excluding the people in our technical side who have been guilty of running around our auditorium chasing for Pokemons in the past. Um, should kids not play Pokemon or read Harry Potter? Okay. Pokemon... 
Harry Potter is like this. First of all, every parent needs to make up their own mind on it, okay? I personally am not worried about kids reading Harry Potter because they will find out very quickly it doesn't work. The first time they try to ride a broom. Yeah, all right. I think it's great for kids to read. And, and I think if parents, you know, have, you know the, the, the Harry Potter thing is kind of gone. There's a lot of fiction out there that's not really the best thing in the world. But I, I think that you can try and turn your kids towards stuff that's better. So I've been really fascinated to see the movies that they made out of the Narnia series. And if you can get your kids to read the Narnia stuff because now there's movies about it and stuff like that. Great. If you're a parent and your kid is obsessed with Harry Potter, uh, be thankful that they read and try and steer them in a good direction. I am not personally worried about it. Did you, Princess, did you read Harry Potter? My daughter didn't read Harry Potter, so I didn't have to deal with that. So she read a bunch of other stuff, though. All right, good. Thank you. Oh, man. Uh, if a man feels like he's a woman trapped in a man's body, is it okay for him to go through sex change? All right. This is a complex question, and it's a very pressing question in our world and society. I did address this a few years ago when we talked about the whole thing around Christian values in a secular world. First of all, the issue of gender, and there are a lot of different words that are used, to, but I'll just use the word gender confusion. First of all, there are biological cases where a people are born without specific gender as it relates to genitalia. And those people need to be treated with love and grace and compassion and helped. The best advice I have ever heard relating to that is that when those people are trying to determine how they will seek in their life, and that's a very traumatic issue. It's an extremely traumatic issue. You say, well, Pastor Dave, you know, there must be something else. No, people are born without legs. And that's all so extremely traumatic. But the, the best thing that a person should do in that situation, I believe, is that they need to, first of all, understand that their identity in, is in Christ, no matter what society may say or anything else, and no matter of the physical issues they will face, because usually there's a lot of hormonal issues involved in this, that, that their identity is in Christ. Christ knows them and loves them and cares for them. And their identity is in the church. They belong in the church no matter what. And then the best advice I got was for them to have DNA testing and find out whether genetically they are male or female. They're, when they know that, then that is my advice for them to choose that option. Now, I, I say this gently. We have some people in our church who have faced that particular specific issue where they were biologically born in such a way that it was, not, it was indeterminate what their gender was. And that's the process we took them through, and I think it worked very, very well. There are other people who their physical expressions and what they feel in their heart don't match up. Now, this is a very complex issue. If you, if you look at the studies, you'll discover that this is not a very common thing, but it's also true that people who feel that, if you want to use the word confusion, I don't mean it pejoratively, that that often resolves itself. And so one of the things I think is that, that quick decisions should not be made. But the most important thing that you and I need to understand about this is, and especially if there's anybody here who feels that way, we love you, we care for you, and your gender is not the most important thing in the world. It, we live in a world where sadly sexuality has been distorted all out. There are, there are people in all ranges of the whole spectrum of, of, of uh, sexual attraction, of sexual feelings, and all those things. And none of them are people who should be anything other than people that we deeply and dearly love. Somebody who deals with those issues in our world often quietly is, is really facing a lot of issues. And we need to express love and acceptance to them we need to make sure that we don't, we're not exploitive of them in any way. We really need to be careful how we talk to them, about them to other people because we're the church. We're the body of Christ. I promise you God loves them. I promise you Jesus died for them. If you can't measure up to that standard of love, you're not his child. Now, the decision as to what they do is a difficult decision. And my 
best understanding of that decision is that you resolve it through thought, through prayer, through seeking God. There are some medical issues involved in all of those things. I personally, and I'm going to go out on a limb here because there will be people who will be unhappy with them. I personally believe that people should stay the physical gender that they are physically born to. And that I understand all of those things about issues. But look, my friends, we are not our longings. We are not our attractions. We are not our temptations. Everybody in this room is tempted towards something. Everybody in this room is, 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 is tempted. Most, almost everybody is tempted sexually. Not all people are. Not all people are tempted sexually, but so many people are, we just assume it's, it's the same. But we're all tempted, and we're all tempted to break God's law in one way or another in different ways. If you may not be tempted in, in a sexual way, but you're tempted to talk about people who are, and so you're tempted to gossip. Look, I, they had a question and answer about what does Pastor Dave think. I can't stand gossips. If God didn't make me forgive them, I wouldn't, because they cause more damage in the church than any single other thing. So the big issue for us is that we need to love them and accept them. I'm not mad at anybody. So Pastor Dave, what's your opinion on LGBTQ+. Uh, number one, I think that that's a broad range of issues. And I think that in fairness, that everybody needs to discuss these issues one by one and never forget we're talking about individuals' lives. We're not mad at anybody. We're not, we're not upset at people. We don't think a certain kind of person is, is yucky or, un, you know, all those kind of things. We want everybody to be redeemed, and the redemption is not their sexuality. It isn't their temptations. It is their relationship with God. And so we need to keep that in mind, and we need to go that direction. Again, like I said, I told you my preference, but I am not going to criticize somebody who makes a different decision. What I am going to do is I'm going to love them. But I, I, I honestly believe that the, the, the body of evidence that exists suggests that those people who go through gender transformation do not find peace through that experience. And that's just what the evidence seemed to suggest. That's why Johns Hopkins University canceled their program a number of years ago. My wife and I have a very good friend who was a part of that program when it was canceled. So we have background going a number of years on this particular issue. And, and the most important thing for us to say as a church is this. If this is not something that you struggle with, then thank God, find out what you do struggle with, overcome that, be right before the Lord in your area, and don't be mad at anybody. We don't care where you've been. We only care where you're going. That's where that's really important. Great question. Thank you. Can a Christian do yoga? Ooh. All right, so this was brought up last night. Let me answer it again. Can a Christian do yoga? Of course they can. Uh, I know a lot of Christians who do yoga. We've had members of our church who are yoga teachers. Let's be honest, okay? No matter how I answer this, people are going to be mad at me. That's why I like Q&A. Um, yoga comes from Hinduism. It is an integral part of Hinduism. Its purpose in Hinduism is to allow a person to reach a state where they empty themselves and they have a spiritual connection with the universe, which is defined in Hinduism as a multiplicity of gods. All right. You cannot deny that. It's true. Now, that does not mean that the specific exercises that people do as a part of yoga are necessarily doing that. Neither does it mean that all yoga teachers are bad. I know people who are Christians who teach yoga. They feel that they have an understanding of the difference between the spiritual aspect of it and the physical aspect of it, and they like the physical aspect, and so they want to teach, and they feel like they've done nothing wrong. I'm, not, I'm going to stand and judge. They stand before the Lord on that. That's between them and the Lord. My advice to people is, if you feel like you want to do yoga and you're not concerned over the spiritual aspects of it, be honest enough to research it. Be honest enough to look into it. And then if you're still comfortable with it and you know that you're not, going to be, uh, you're not going to be having any kind of spiritual influence, then that's between you and God, all right? But I, my question is you need to make sure that you understand. The, so to say all yoga is demonic is wrong. 
and to say, ah, oh, there's nothing spiritual involved in yoga. That's also wrong. I have a friend, one of the guys we pray for. You guys, we pray for Stan all the time. And when I first met Stan, Stan had been practicing Aikido for 30 years. And we became a follower of Jesus Christ. He was really, really good. Yeah? One of his teachers was some guy who made a career out of movies, Steven Seagal. Stan was one of Steven's uh, students. All right? So I asked Stan, when I knew Stan, he'd been a believer a little while, and he was teaching self-defense to the Indonesian military and unarmed combat and all this stuff. And he said, but I don't do Aikido anymore. I use the principles, but I don't do it anymore. I said, Stan, why don't you do Aikido anymore? And he said, oh, Pastor Dave, it's all spiritual. There, there are things that you learn and things that you can do, and you can do them, but Aikido is a spiritual thing. I said, what do you mean? He said, Pastor Dave, I prayed to Shinto gods, and they answered me. I don't want to do that anymore. I respect that. Now, if somebody else comes and says, oh, Pastor Dave, I've just learned Aikido, I'll tell them about Stan. I'll ask them to think about it. I'll ask them to research it. I'll ask them to pray about it. And if they still want to do it, then they need to be aware of the issues. But anytime you do anything that has a claim that it impacts you spiritually, you need to think about what that impact would be. All right? Is that enough on yoga? My, I always tell people, well, I really need to strengthen my core. Do Pilates. That's, you know. Yeah. All right? What's your biggest dating tip? Ha! All right, you ask yourself this question. What kind of person do I really like? Yeah, what is it that I'm looking for? And then you ask yourself the second question, which is more important. What are they looking for? And then you try and be that kind of person. I was talking to a, a lady one time, and and she said, Pastor Dave, I really, 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 this goes back a few years. Pastor Dave, I really, really want to meet a godly man. Really? You want to meet a godly man? Yeah. I really want to, I, I want to have a husband who loves the Lord and studies the Bible and everything. I said, that's good. I said, where do you go to meet men? Oh, kudos bar. Really? This was the old days. You, those of you, when the Hilton was the Hilton, you know what I'm talking about. That was like, in those early, early days, 27 years ago, that was the number one pickup spot in town. Did you know that? You're all too young. And I asked her, I said, how many godly men have you found hanging out in a pickup bar? Well, none. Come on, folks, let's be realistic. Your greatest dating tip is this. Be the kind of person that will draw the kind of person you want to be with. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, do you want to be married to somebody smart, that's well-read, that understands things? Then work on your smartness. Read more things. Do you want to be married to somebody who is uh, spiritual? then you need to be more spiritual. You want to be married to somebody who likes to travel? Then you need to, you know, not be the kind of person who, you know. But, but remember this, folks. Often in the whole premarital thing, opposites really attract. But remember, after marriage, opposites attack. And so, you know, understand and clearly understand the person you're getting involved with. And then don't be unkind to them when it turns out 10 years later you don't like that anymore. Yeah, I was talking to somebody, this was a few years ago, and I was talking to somebody, and they, and they said, I just can't stand my husband. I said, well, what is it you don't like? Oh, man, that's just, he's irritating to me all the time, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I said, tell me your story, tell me your story. So they mad and all this stuff. And I said, well, what was it about you, that this person that are attracted? He said, well, I'm kind of shy, you know, and, and what I really like when I'm dating this person, we'd go to a party, and he's the life of the party, and I'm with him, and everybody's paying attention, and he's funny and witty, you know, da-da-da-da-da. Ah, that's great. I, okay, we talked for a while, and I said, what is it that really bothers you about the guy? Oh, man, whenever we go to a party, he's talking to everybody, and he's, you know, everybody's paying attention to him, and he's not really paying attention to me. I said, hello. What you pick is what you get. No trade-ins. Yeah, doesn't get to work that way. All right? When I met my wife, we were both interested in kind of the same thing. I was looking for quality, and she was looking for quantity, and we found it in each other. So it worked out well. All right, are we on our last question? All right, last question. Well, that's a two-part question. What's the biggest miracle I've had until now? Can I tell you the honest truth? I have seen a number of amazing physical miracles. I've seen paralyzed people move. I've seen people that were dying, no longer dying. Can I be honest? I know myself. The biggest miracle 
is that I'm, I met my wife and that she loved me, cared for me. Because although there are many, many things about me that are very secure, I don't mind if people disagree with me because I think they're all wrong anyway and, you know, all of those kind of things. There was always deep down inside of me a fear that, that, that really I was somewhat unlovable. And when I went, my wife and we went through this very complicated process of things uh, that brought us together, uh, she really knows me. She knows me better than anybody in the world. She knows me way better. And she still loves me and chooses to be with me. And that was transformative to me. Now, I met her when I was already, uh, I met her when I was already 30 years old. And so uh, I had, I, I, you know, I, I had lived my life. I, I had met lots of people. I had, I, I had all my own insecurities and things like that. And the fact that she, the Lord brought us together was remarkable to me. And so that, honestly, that's, that has meant more to me and changed me more than anything else. As a pastor, how did I become a pastor? It was somewhat circumstantial. I was in Hong Kong, and I was attending a church while I was writing a book with my mom, and the pastor asked me to fill in for a few months. I'd never wanted to be a pastor. Never, I had rebelled against the idea of being a pastor, and about three weeks of doing it, I realized, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. And so I, I, I've been a pastor the rest of my life. I love it. I love being your pastor. And I can honestly say to all of you, there is nothing in life that I want to do different than what I'm doing now. I hope you'll all always be a part of IES. I, 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 hope, I, I hope that you'll be in Jakarta. If you're not from Jakarta, be in Jakarta as long as I'm able to be your pastor. I've committed to the deacons. The deacons know I've promised I'll give nine more years to the church. I'm 61 years old. I'll give nine more years to the church if you keep voting me in. If you ever decide you don't want me, it's okay. I can go do something else, but I love being your pastor, and I, I just feel like God put the combination of different things in my life, so I found my gift, and I'm thankful for that, and that's my answer to that, and, and, and let me say this to you. All of you need to understand this. I rejoice in that, but I realize it's not the same for people. I knew I was going to be a full-time minister since I was 11 years old. So when I'm trying to give advice to people that are trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life, I can't relate because I've always known. And ever since I first pastored, I've always known that's ever I want to do. But let me say to all of you in a way that you clearly need to understand is that God loves you and he has a plan and purpose for your life. And I hope you find a career that fits your gifts and skills. I hope you find a life partner that fits your gifts and skills. I hope you find a country that fits your gifts and skills. But whatever, even if you don't find that comfort area, God loves you and he has a complete plan and purpose for your life. And he will always love you and care for you. And you can count on that no matter what's going on around you.